check, check. We good? All right. Woo! Welcome everybody to Creative Morning Charlotte. Oh my goodness, look at all these people. I'm Matt Olin, I'm your host. This building was built in 1924. Henry Ford commissioned Albert Kant to design this space for the production of Model T's and Model A's. 240,000 square feet, 800 feet long, 300 feet wide, bigger than Chelsea Market, which is 800 by 200. Yeah, we got you beat, New York. We are working really hard to transform this place into a creative hub and reuse all these existing buildings and fill them with people who are doing innovative things in tech, food, art, and just create a place for people to gather and connect. Typically, I like to pull a phrase or two out of our manifesto to maybe talk about one of the one of the reasons that we, we do this every month. The phrase I want to point out today is inspiring change in our neighborhoods and cities. You know, we're sitting in this historic building that's seen plenty of change itself over the years. It got me thinking about our daughter, Mirabelle, who is here. She's almost five. And let me tell you why this phrase reminds me of her. Because for years, Mirabelle was scared to go underwater. And recently, a very gifted swim instructor, Miss D, inspired change in Mirabelle, convinced her to take the plunge. There she is, underwater, taking the plunge, right? And now, what's so funny is that we can't keep her above the water. She's experienced the magic of going below the surface, of going deeper. One of the reasons why we're here as a chapter, gathering every month, is to inspire you to keep going, to go deeper to go below the surface, to do that thing that you've been scared to do, that thing. You know what thing I'm talking about, that thing you've been scared to do. We want to be here to ins inspire you to do that. Because I think that's where the real exciting things in life are waiting for us. It's just below that surface. So I spot this chick, I see she pondering. Got me really intrigued on what she wondering. Oh hell, I should go up and ask her. On another note, that could be a disaster. What you got to lose? Look where you're standing. If she dishes you, you'll be right where you're standing. At least you got an answer. That's better than nothing. Most walk through life, never going for some. I'm like, hold up, swallow my pride and take a breath. Treat it just like everything in life a test. Excuse me, miss. I'm not sorry I stopped you. My name is KM. I want to get to know you. is the you. sponsor of, of our theme of Beyond. And we're going to record a very quick video to our mothership, our founding chapter of New York. Hey, New York! We're creating here! <laughs> I am very excited that after a year of planning and A-B testing these questions on you guys every month, we have our very first date for, the, for a Queen City Quiz Show preview, and all of you are invited on May 18th. A preview of what we're going to be doing in our summer series of the Queen City Quiz Show, where we pit, pit two communities in Charlotte against one another and talk about Charlotte trivia. You've all been incredibly supportive. The Knight Foundation has been incredibly supportive of us. We want you all out there, and if you go to qcquizshow.com, you can sign up, and we will give all of you advance notice when the tickets are available. Harvey Gant was born in Charleston in 1961. He applied to Clemson University and was admitted in January 1963 under court order, becoming the first black student to attend a previously all-white school in South Carolina. He graduated from Clemson with honors and a Bachelor of Architecture and then moved to Charlotte to join the firm of Odell Associates. Five years later, in 1970, he received a Master's of City Planning from MIT, and in 1971, he returned to Charlotte to co-found Gant Huberman Architects. His firm has won many, many, many awards. His service to and honors from such organizations as the American Institute of Architects, the National Organization of Minority Architects, the North Carolina Board of Architecture, and many more, really are just much, much too lengthy to, to, to list here. He's been a lecturer at many colleges and universities. He served on the visiting committee of the Graduate School of Design at Harvard. He was a chairman of the National Capital Planning Commission, appointed by President Bill Clinton. Oh, President Bill Clinton. Let me just have a moment here for a second. <laughs> okay, moving on. And of course, he's been an activist in the political arena since 1974. More than three terms on the Charlotte City Council, mayor pro tem, and then became Charlotte's first African-American mayor in 1983. He's served on enough boards to put us all to shame. He's won so many honors, it's I won't even begin to cover them. Although I will say this, 
Dude's got a museum named after him, so I just want to put that out there. The Harvey B. Gantt Center for African American Arts and Culture, and he holds honorary doctorate degrees from eight universities. So I'm going to stop, and we're going to bring him up. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to speak to us on Beyond, the one, the only, Harvey Gantt, everyone. <laughs> Harvey Gantt. Good morning. All of these people are going to be late for work. And that's they have amazing. an excuse. They have an excuse. They were having breakfast with you. Um, thank you. Did you have any idea what you were getting into here when you no, said No, <laughs> not at all when Dick McCracken called. Not at all. <laughs> um, all right. Well, let's, we've, we've crafted a handful of questions that are sort of inspired by our theme of beyond. And so we'll just jump in and see where, where they take us. And we want to start with this one. You grew up in South Carolina. As I just mentioned, you were the first African-American student admitted to Clemson. What was it about your childhood that enabled you to think beyond society's boundaries and expectations? I grew up in a very wonderful family. Mom, who watched over us. A dad, who took care of us. Lots of supporters in the community, from the church to the Boy Scout leader to the doctors who took care of us in our segregated neighborhood. And <clears throat> if there was a theme running through my childhood, it was always that the promise of America was going to be made real for you. And what that really meant was you are going to rise above the educational level of your parents, who went as far as eighth grade, you were going to get an education because that's the way you're going to lift yourself up. And so we always had this hope that the promise, the promise, the promise, the promise was going to be made real. Even when we went to the back of the bus, because Mama said, we got to do that for right now. Or even when I passed the schoolhouse, to go to my elementary school, and that schoolhouse looked so much better than the one that I went to. There was this promise that things were going to get better. And it happened for me. It happened for my family. It happened for my neighbors when the Supreme Court said, you know what? This evil system of segregation is unconstitutional. And that was a hero day. That was a, a special day in the life of the Gantt family because the promise was getting a lot closer. So I always grew up with a lot of hope that things were going to be better for us. Well, that is beautiful. And I'm curious, I mean, you're a, you're a father, um, grandfather. So how do you encourage your children to think beyond convention, you know, to pursue their own creative instincts or, or passions. Is there anything that you've imparted from, like, from your past that you're now passing on to your, your kids? Well, first of all, all my kids have grown and gone, um, and I'm dealing with uh, their, their, their children, all nine of them. I uh, <laughs> dealt with them last week. Uh, I can look back on it now with a smile and say it was a really great experience again to do that. Um, we always imparted that same hope. They actually knew what we overcame when we grew up in segregated Charleston. They saw all of those civil rights victories. And, and we said, you know, you've got a responsibility to carry on from that. You, 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 sh you just can't sit back and be satisfied in your own achievement. The promise, the promise, the promise has to be made real for a whole lot of people who had not been inspired, maybe, by their life circumstances. And so it was, it was very, very important that Sonia, Erica, Angela, and Adam understood that they had a responsibility to, to do well and then to achieve and to reach out 
to make the promise real for others who might be less fortunate. Um, it didn't mean that they were going to have an easy time of doing it. Uh, we did not try to, 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 to tell our children that because the laws of segregation were gone or that they had seen very tangible civil rights movement that, that had done so well, that the battle was over. Uh, my kids were always amazed that we sat down at lunch counters just to get a Coke and a hot dog, which seems so silly now that we look back on it, that we had to go through all of what we went through. But I said, even though those battles are over, perhaps your generation and generations beyond may have an even more difficult time, a more difficult time, eliminating the real vestiges of racism that's going to be tougher than laws that are written on the books across this country. Uh, it's going to be tougher uh, fighting uh, a battle that really dwells in people's hearts, a position or a perspective that they have uh, that we can't get at so easily. It's easy to have laws for public accommodations and riding a bus or going to school. Those, those days are past, but now when you get in school, what do you experience? And how are you going to overcome that? And how are you going to stay optimistic that the promise is going to be made real for a lot of folks? Beautiful. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to shift for a moment to so talk a little bit about your accomplished career as an architect. You know, here at Creative Mornings, we, our mantra is that everyone is creative. Everyone is creative, and, and we welcome people from every discipline and background to, to come here and celebrate the innate creativity that we all share. Now, as an architect, you have to look at a blank piece of paper or, and a site with nothing on it, and, and I'm curious about your own creative process. How do you see beyond that? Tell us a little bit about your process. First of all, it's the delight to be amongst so many creative people, people that I've met this morning. Uh, I chose architecture when I was in the ninth grade because a teacher told me that that's what someone who had skills for drawing things ought to consider. And, uh, and, and um, I'm, I'm just blessed that I wanted to do this for such a long, long time. Now, back to your question. Um, I design, my firm designed buildings for people. So we don't start off by looking at the site. We start off by looking at the client. And we look at what it is they need, what it is they tell us they want, whether it's a work environment, a play environment, or whatever, uh, we start off with the client. And then we try to match what their needs are to the physical location that they're going to go on. And that's where the, the excitement comes in. Um, you're now thinking about um, uh, the programmatic requirements after talking and meeting with these people for some time. And you're trying to then say, there's a site that has clear dimensions to it. How do you fit those programmatic requirements and to form a building? So the creative process for me and many of the architects who work for me, and some are in the audience this morning, uh, is a continual thing. Once you get locked in on that, I could be uh, working in my backyard and all of a sudden it hits me that this church needs a certain look, a certain feel, or this couple needs, uh, they love entertaining and, 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 and they like to cook. So that kitchen ought to be a special kind of place. These kinds of inspirations come and you write it down as quick as you can or you lock it into your head and then you get in there and you create. And uh, that's what I loved about architecture. I love this creative thing 
that even after I've had a great weekend playing golf or tennis, I couldn't wait to get into the office to really work with that client and that piece of paper to make it happen. Do you, do you have a favorite project that you've done to date? No. <laughs> I'm not going to answer that question. That, 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 that's, lo that's loaded. Because I want my clients to understand that all of, all of our projects, their project particularly, is very important to me. <laughs> so, but I will tell you this. The greatest satisfaction for me is when I visit the project after it's been designed. And I can walk into that space and just look around to see if what they told me way back in the beginning is how they're actually using the space. And that's, that's, that's just a wonderful feeling. When I go to Friendship Baptist Church on a Sunday morning, I can sit there and watch the sun making its way through the skylights and through the stained glass windows and wonder, did we capture, did we capture that feeling of sacredness that a church ought to have? And, and, and that's the satisfaction. So that, for that client, I know they're enjoying it, so that's my favorite project. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But for another client, it may be something else holding it. <laughs> love it. Um, I would love to hear, you know, as you look back on your career, and you mentioned themes in your childhood and the lives of your children, when you look back at your body of work, both as an architect and perhaps even as a p politician, do you see any themes that have emerged for you, whether that was intentional or organically? You know, I think this happens to authors and musicians and filmmakers and, and artists of all kinds, where maybe at a certain point in their life they look back and they start to see a theme emerge. Uh, I have often said that um, I, I, I was always interested in exceeding the expectations of my clients. Uh, if they came in with that idea and we put together that building, I always wanted my buildings to exceed what they had in mind, to be even better to reach, to reach, um, that, 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 was, that was most important to me. The other piece is architecture is about assembling a lot of things when you start to build the building. You're putting together hundreds of thousands of pieces of material to create this harmonious whole. This thing that delights, makes people feel good if they're coming to work or if they're going home, uh, spending a weekend, whatever. It's putting together a lot of things and making them harmonious. I also thought that way about my political life. Um, I saw a relationship between what I did for my full-time job and what I did as a contribution to the community. This, this need to take all of the diversity out there and all of the opinions out there, and as a mayor, try to assemble and hear everybody and then see if we can craft a creative solution. So I could link what I did in the forums of government to what I did on the drafting board every day, and that made, that, that's the theme of my work. Yeah, a, a, a real connection. But it, almost like your life as an architect and as a creative person served you in that other role in a way that maybe being a career politician uh, perhaps wouldn't have, you know, some, some of those skills that you brought to that role. I, I, I actually thought that was our advantage. In fact, I spent a lot of time in my career going around the country telling architects that they needed to pay more attention to not only just the buildings they designed, but the communities that they were putting those buildings in. And some of us needed to get into the forums of government itself because we could see things and we could look down the road and particularly in city government where we're talking about assembling things. City council is all about hardware and umbilical cords of water and sewer line that give life to communities. Uh, and we could see that sometimes better than some of our colleagues on council or in those forums. And, and we should use our skills more to affect what the community looks like uh, overall.
I, it sounds like a charge for more creative beings to enter public service. I yes, love this that's idea. It, that's exactly right. right. The power exactly of creative right. thinking. That's exactly right. All right, now this next question is inspired by, very much inspired by our theme of beyond. Get ready. Have you ever gone beyond the point of return with something in your life? Gone beyond the point of return. <sighs> it's a political thing, if you don't mind. I was playing tennis one day in my backyard with Mel Watt, who many of you know is a longtime congressperson from this area. And we kept chatting about the fact that there was a certain senator that was not going to get a challenge. Um, and um, I said to Mel, do we have the guts to, to get into this thing? To get into this Senate race, this was 1990, and I recognize that most of you, many of you aren't even born. <clears throat> but do we have the guts to get into this? And we left the tennis court <clears throat> at the end of the third set. And, 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 and I felt, you know, let's not just talk about it. Let's do as your daughter did. Let's dive deep. Let's get into it. The reason why it was a point of, of going deeper was, was, was it was important, even if we didn't win, that a viewpoint, a viewpoint be expressed that reflected a lot of North Carolina. So we dove deep, went beyond, and had no idea where we would raise the money that's needed in politics, or whether or not we had the support beyond the borders of the city of Charlotte. And I was a losing candidate in my third term for mayor of Charlotte. A lot of people don't remember that. So what gives you the nerve to believe that you could dive deep or go beyond into a race like that with all these liabilities? You know, you're from Charlotte, which is not highly respected at that time in the rest of the state, and you, you didn't go to the UNC. Uh, uh, you went to Clemson. You're, you're from South Carolina, um, and you're black. But we went beyond anyway. And even though we lost it, it was worth having that conversation with the people of North Carolina. Uh, one way or Love it. Mr. Gant, are, are there any goals you haven't yet achieved? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> if I haven't, I'm, I'm a little bit too old now to really be setting too many new ones. I love but yeah, all but, that. But yes, yes, yes. I'm, there are some goals. And the goals have more to do with this community reaching and going beyond. And, and I work now very quietly. I don't, I think I need to be off the stage. I shouldn't even be on this one. Uh, but, but to encourage young people. I was in my 30s when I got on city council. To encourage young people, it's their time now. It is their time to, to get out there to do some things. We haven't solved all the problems. This is a great city we're living in. It can be a wonderful laboratory on issues of diversity, on educating poor kids, on health care, um, just a number of things. But you are going to have to get involved. So my goal is to see as many young folks, which is one reason I came this morning, is that I want to see younger people get involved. I want to see us move past the politics of fear, which is driving so much of what's happening 
in Charlotte, in North Carolina, and across this country. I want to see everybody have an opportunity, which is uh, why I'm a little bit disgusted with the HB2 resolution. Uh, I, 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 um, I know there are things we have to do in politics for compromise, but I know that we are better than that. We are actually better than that. And, and I'm, I think we gotta fight. Amen. We're gonna end with this question, because we are after 10. Um, so here's what we're gonna end on. Do you have a final charge for us? What do you, in the spirit of beyond, what do you want us to go out from here and do, if you were to leave us with those words. Stay engaged if you already are. This is, this is a great group you've got here, and I hope you uh, continue to, to, to keep this going. Stay engaged. Don't become so focused on what your specific career is that you forget that there's a community you live in. We live in a great city, but it's actually going to get to become an even greater city, not by how many buildings we build or how much money people make in their businesses, but how well we reach out and engage others and how much we care about issues of diversity and poverty and people who still can't see the promise because there's so many obstacles in their way. And you know what, I'm counting on you. My kids hear this all the time. You know, when they talk about things going bad or things not, I said, I'm counting on you. You know, we've done all we can do in an activist way, we're gonna now just give advice, like I'm giving it to you this morning, just giving advice. But the engines, the, the, the people that make this community go, and will make this community go, in the next 30 or 40 years, are sitting right in front of me. You gotta do something. And if you end the day not doing anything except caring about yourself, that's one more day lost to making this a great community. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Harvey Gant, please join me in thanking him.